thank you very much. I'm deeply honored for this uh, opportunity. Um, I have been asked to talk about PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. And I'm going to cover the breadth of the field because my title is From Adolescence to Senescence. Um, I just learned that I have to use this pointer, if at all. Maybe I won't. No, it doesn't display quickly. So I just won't use a pointer. You'll have to imagine where I'm pointing as I go forward. I begin now with a, a whole variety of consensus meetings about PCOS. This topic has emerged as being extremely important over time and more and more so as the years have progressed. So I've been involved in all of these meetings. It started with the NIH conference in New York, where, uh, sorry, in Washington, where the definition, the NIH definition was sort of envisioned. It really wasn't a consensus conference. Then Rotterdam, then Thessaloniki, which was primarily aimed at infertility. We had a meeting in Amsterdam where we talked about the metabolic and other concerns. Uh, there was an NIH uh, conference that sort of defined what we should be calling it since there's so much confusion. And finally, you've seen the guidelines, the so-called evidence-based guidelines that rose out of Helen Thede and, and the group in uh, Melbourne together with a worldwide affiliation of different societies. And then I'll touch on this. So this was the original NIH meeting. This is sort of how PCOS got on the map. And this was really not a consensus conference, and there was no consensus. But you see how young we were in those days. Myself, uh, uh, John Nessler, Maria New, you may recognize some of these faces along the way. But this was where it sort of all really began. Then followed Rotterdam. I mean, the Europeans were really pushing for this ultrasound definition of polycystic ovaries, and the Americans were sort of you know, fighting against it a little bit. But we came together for Rotterdam, and, and the ovarian focus uh, sort of won the day, uh, as you all know now. Uh, the three criteria for polycystic ovary syndrome, polycystic changes of the ovary, menstrual irregularity, and hyperangiogenism, either biochemical or by expression, what the skin does. All you need is two out of three. Because you only need two out of the three, the expression is going to be varied, and you have various phenotypes. Four phenotypes are possible, A through D which a lot of people have sort of questioned, um, and particularly the Androgen Excess Society. You know, how can, and I've been president of that society, many of you have been members, um, how can you be an Androgen Excess Society and not interested in Androgen Excess as the primary focus? And, and sure enough, the Androgen Excess Society requires that you have hyperangenism as a sort of a bottom line part of the diagnosis together with some sort of ovarian dysfunction, be it polycystic ovaries or not. However, I was involved in this with uh, Angie Donaif. NIH put together a consensus conference of experts. These are outside individuals in clinical medicine that evaluated the data and came to their conclusions. And not to belabor the story longer, they came back and said, OK, use Rotterdam. For better or for worse, we don't have anything better. This is how the world should diagnose PCOS, using Rotterdam criteria, realizing it's heterogeneous, realizing that you can have different expressions. So what about the genetics? We've known that PCOS is a genetic disorder. There are many mother-to-daughter pairs. There are brothers. There are parents that have linkage uh, to biochemical or clinical and we know it's inheritable. But the GWA studies that first came out of China, as illustrated here, really suggested that this is not a single gene disorder. In fact, it's not even necessarily oligogenic. It's inheritable, but through a variety of susceptibility genes. So GWAS was the first through the Han Chinese population and thousands of women that identified sites on the second chromosome and chromosome 9 that you have a bunch of susceptibility genes. And follow-up studies confirmed that on chromosome 2, you have areas of the LH receptor and FSH receptor that are vulnerable. And you can have polymorphisms that can make you more susceptible for having PCOS. But also other areas, like on the ninth chromosome, dendia is very popular. That's a membrane-bound 
uh, moiety that has a role in hyperandrogenism. And so there's been a lot of attractiveness as to pinpointing these areas in the overpathophysiology. But it's not that simple. The expression varies. And in a European study of susceptibility genes, only the second chromosome, LHFSH receptors, sort of came up, the lit up amongst susceptibility genes. So there is something to it, but there's varied expression. It's not universal. And right now, it's just a susceptibility. There's no genetic way to make this diagnosis. I'm going to talk about the consequences, the spectrum throughout life, starting with an early diagnosis towards the end of the teen years, moving on into menopause and beyond. And I start out with adolescence because I think many of us have pushed back that you cannot use Rotterdam to diagnose PCOS in adolescence. And the reason is all the features, the three features that you need, the hyperangenism, ovarian features, and the irregular menses are characteristics of the teen years that go through transition. So if you have all of these, absolutely all of these, two, three years after menarche, then it's a possibility that you have PCOS. But just to give you an idea, the ovary changes dramatically from a typical polycystic ovary to one that is not. And this variation in time varies for the first three to four years after menarche. I can show you, this is a prospective study from Chile, where over a two, three year span, you could go from a polycystic ovary to a not a polycystic ovary and back again back and forth, back and forth. And of course, with teen, you do abdominal ultrasound where the resolution is not as clear. So ovarian ultrasound becomes a very weak predictor, just like menstrual irregularity, which is a feature of adolescence. So myself, Enrico Carmina, who's an internist, uh, endocrinologist, and Sharon Oberfield, who's a pediatric endocrinologist, we came together and put this paper together um, a few years ago, and I can't point. But you really need to have everything. You have to have significant hirsutism, elevated levels of testosterone, polycystic ovaries and ultrasound, which here is really ovarian volume rather than follicle counts, as well as ironclad menstrual irregularity three, four years after menarche to have the diagnosis. And the final analysis, it sort of doesn't matter. And, and we are quick not to label. It is terrible to label a young girl with the diagnosis of PCOS when she may or may not have it. It doesn't matter. You treat according to specific symptomatology. If she is irregular, you treat that. If she has hyperangenism, hirsutism, you treat that. You don't have to label that woman. But according to you know, the most recent consensus data, it is suggested that if you are seven or eight years post-menarche, um, you know, you're getting into your late teens, then, it, then, then all those vari variations in symptomatology should go away, and it's not unreasonable. I'm going to move now to various areas of the Rotterdam criteria, and I want to focus on a very ultrasound, because this was the focus of Rotterdam. This is how this sort of whole thing emerged. Ultrasound criteria have changed over time, extremely varied. It used to be 12 peripherally oriented follicles, right, according to the old Pulse and Frank's uh, criteria. And some people have suggested maybe you should just use AMH. The bottom line there is probably that's not accurate enough. I used to love this. This is Anna Maria Fugesu. This is what we think the polycystic ovary should look like. And so Anna Maria suggests suggested that since you have this increase in stromal mass and peripheral orientation, that if you did a ratio of the follicular diameter area over the total area, that you would get some vision of the ovary and, and the stromal area, which actually is correlated with the angiogen excess, made a lot of sense. But in prospective studies out of Cornell, and these are the data from Chris et al, and it might be hard to read, Using sensitivity analysis and ROC curves, it was determined that it was the number of follicles, rather than volume, rather than the stromal area, that determines the diagnosis of the polycystic ovary. And so FNPO, follicle number per ovary, stands as the most accurate predictor of the polycystic ovary. And, and as you can see on the top, and I can't point, the very top on the left, is the follicle number per ovary 
clearly separating from a normal population. In the green arrow, ovarian volume is the next closest with a volume cut off at about 10 cc's. And finally, my favorite, which didn't pan out in this analysis, is the, the stromal ratio, the, the peripheral to stromal ratio. That really, so the morphology, how it actually looks to you, you see a ultrasound and it kind of looks like a polycystic ovary, that doesn't pan out in sensitivity analysis for the accurate ultrasound diagnosis of PCOS. But still, still, the diagnosis is all over the place. If you look at ultrasound resolution as a major variable, and of course in adolescents using abdominal ultrasound versus vaginal ultrasound, and differences in the megahertz of the ultrasound transducer, you get variations in the theme. It's clear that the number of follicle counts is the most predictable criterion. However, different authors have suggested from the original two to nine, which is totally inadequate. Chris cutoff was 28, our own data is 22. The evidence-based guidelines from Helena Thede suggest about 19. So there's variation there, but it's in the 20s uh, in terms of the accuracy of the ultrasound criteria for the diagnosis of it. And it's clearly the number of follicles. It's not the volume necessarily as a secondary criterion uh, or even the morphologic appearance. So a surrogate, second surrogate is a volume of 10 cc's. And an AMH by, by meta-analysis has suggested a cut point of about 4.7. Anything over 4.7 is consistent with PAO or, or polycystic ovary syndrome. But look at this. These are our own data. The AMH level varies by phenotype according to, to Rotterdam. And so if you look at the far right of this slide, the FNPO, the follicle number, is fairly consistent as a diagnosis by ultrasound across phenotypes. But in the non-classic phenotypes of PCOS, phenotype C, phenotype D, your AMH levels are lower. So if you just use AMH to make that diagnosis, you would be mistaken. And of course, some women who are young and healthy and don't have PCOS have a polycystic ovary, don't have PCOS. So so, you know, you get confused by just using AMH. I admit that it is valuable and it's an adjunct and we use it in ART all the time as, as a helpful guide for induction of ovulation. Now, another important thing about the ultrasound diagnosis is that it influences with age. As I'll show you, the ovary decreases as a function of age. So if you're in your 30s, your follicle counts are gonna be lower and so your cutoffs for the criterion for the diagnosis of PCO may not be 28, as has been suggested. It's likely to be more like 20. So let's move on. The next area is androgen excess, which is a major presenting symptomatology. And Fairman Galloway scores have been used universally as at least a descriptive method of identifying central distribution of male-dependent, antigen-dependent, antigen excess. However, the Fairman galloway score varies by, on a population base. And I think in India, your Fairman galloway scores are much like what it is in our Caucasian population in the United States or the UK, whereas in East Asia, in Japan and China, their cutoffs are more like three and four as opposed to seven and eight as a criterion for the diagnosis of hirsutism. Now, the driver of this is thought to be androgens. And if you're very careful about how you measure androgens and what androgens you measure, across, across the board, ovarian and adrenal androgens are both gonna be elevated. One of the major concerns about androgens in the diagnosis of PCOS are their assays have been lacking the sensitivity because they're geared for male type ranges to be able to diagnose the sensitivity and free testosterone measurements are not very accurate either. But in the last few years, what has really emerged, and this is extremely important in the next evolution of our understanding, is that the predominant circulating androgens in women, and in PCOS in particular, as on the right, on the right par chart, chart, are the 11 oxoantigens. These are 11 hydroxylated androgens that are adrenal derived, and quantitatively, they are as potent or more potent than the regular antigens, and they are quantitatively larger. So 
that is a big hole in our clinical, clinical armamentarium to diagnose what is happening. Now, there are women, even with PCOS, who present without hirsutism and those who do. And the ones who do have something else. It's not just that the ovary is making more testosterone, it's that their skin revs up the signal. And this is earlier work we've done that occasions the thought that it is 5-alpha reductase in, in the pilosebaceous unit that determines the fate of the expression of the hyperangenism, right? It's the conversion to DHT and distal metabolites. And so we did a, a whole series of papers on measurements of 3-alpha-dial-G, which is a distal metabolite of 5-alpha reductase, to determine the fate of skin angiogenic metabolism. And as you can see here, Similarly to those patients with idiopathic hirsutism, PCOS patients who present with hirsutism have heightened 5-alpha reductase activity. So you can envision a woman with PCOS, her testosterone might be normal, but she has enhanced 5-alpha reductase activity and she presents with hirsutism as a complaint. And therefore, the treatment of hirsutism is by and large the treatment of the peripheral disorder. Without getting into too much details, targeting 5-alpha reductase and or the androgen receptor is the way to go. So the guiding principles is peripheral targeting. It also benefits it tremendously to lower the androgen source, be it ovary or adrenal. And you can accomplish both of those simply by using a combination oral contraceptive. Now, the Endocrine Society guidelines for many years now, and I've been on all of those panels, have suggested what we call monotherapy, just use birth control pills, which I have argued against. And finally, the 2018 guidelines, I think, that have just come out, I really pushed them and pushed them, and they've agreed that first-line therapy could be a combination of oral concepts and an angiogen. They used to say, wait, 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 don't start an antiangiogen. If you have significant hirsutism, it makes sense to start them at the same time. But it recommended against certain antiangiogens, like flutamide because of hepatic toxicity should be avoided. The other things don't work. Topical antiangiogens, insulin sensitizing drugs, glucocorticoids, agonists, they don't work very well. So it's OCPs and, and one of the antiangiogens uh, that would be most effective. And it takes time. Localized therapies are an adjunct. I won't get into this in the interest of time. This is in the Endocrine Society guidelines as well. They are good adjuncts. So after suppression, you have to remove hair, and laser treatments and so forth are, are very effective. Let's move to infertility. Now, the classic paradigm is that these are anovulatory patients. And for most of the phenotypes, except for phenotype C, which is the ovulatory phenotype, you're dealing with anovulation. So if you can induce ovulation effectively, you will achieve pregnancy success. But the ovulatory phenotype, phenotype C, varies widely in different populations. And, and in, in some places, like even in China or Italy, the prevalence is 30 to 40 percent. They also present with infertility. But let's focus on the anovulatory source. The culprit is varied. One would think it's androgens. Androgens are important, but it's not the be and end all. There's insulin resistance, BMI, the inherent characteristics of the ovary, the fact that AMH is increased, the expression is increased, AMH in inhibits FSH action. All those things play. But also, according to GWAS studies, there could be defects in LHFSH. Uh, that also figure into the infertility of these patients and causing the, ana uh, the anovulation. Androgens are important. The bottom line here is on the log rank scale of what's important, androgens probably are less important than what's happening with insulin resistance. So this is a little cartoon that talks about fat, adiposity, and insulin resistance. So adipose tissue begets adipocytokines, these act at the membrane level to induce problems of insulin signaling. We're not at the receptor level, but by second messenger, you get serine phosphorylation, which is less efficient. You get insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, that stimulates ovarian and adrenal hyperangiogenism that feeds back on fat cells, causing more cytokine and adipocytokine dysregulation. Now, 
these are all important for metabolic things. So we're going to talk about cardiovascular disease in a minute. All these fat-derived cell uh, signals beget a metabolic disturbance, but they are also important for fertility and disrupting ovulation. And the ones I want to focus on are leptin being elevated, adiponectin being downregulated, and coumarin being upregulated. These three have been the most studied in PCOS. Not to belabor the point, in vivo and in vitro studies have suggested the higher the leptin level, the more fat, the more leptin, the higher the leptin, the more inhibition of ovulation occurs. The opposite is true for adiponectin. Adiponectin is downregulated. If you're fat, you have lower adiponectin. That lower adiponectin is bad because adiponectin is beneficial for improving follicular growth and, uh, and also health of embryos. Good work by Joanne Richards. Camarin correlates very well with fat content. So the fatter you are, the more camarin you have. And camarin correlates very well with markers of insulin resistance. So the more camarin you have, the more insulin resistant you are. And the best ratio surrogate is the leptin to adiponectin ratio, right? High leptin, low adiponectin, more insulin resistance. Camarin does almost as well. And there are good in vitro data uh, and in vivo data in the rat, actually, showing that Camarin causes follicular arrest. So if you're fat, you have a lot of insulin, you have high levels of Camarin, you will inhibit follicular growth and cause more atresia. And this is actually what we see clinically in patients undergoing ovulation induction. Now, in the fifth Thessaloniki conference for infertility, Thessaloniki is this place in, in Greece, which was uh, very nice for this consensus meeting. At that time, first-line therapy was considered to be clomiphene, and we've all used clomiphene for years and years and still continuing to do so. But NIH conducted through the reproductive network a randomized trial of clomiphene versus letrozole in women with PCOS, and letrozole performed a whole lot better both in terms of cumulative and live birth rates with a higher ovulatory rate, as you can see here. These are data uh, by Rick Legro, who first authored it. Rick was one of my first fellows in this whole area. And as you can see here, in every age strata, letrozole is better than clomiphene. It's probably m more beneficial the more obese the woman is, but even in non-obese patients, letrozole performed better. But what else? What about phenotype C? What if you're ovulating quasi-normal periods, you still have infertility? There are many reasons for this. There are at least three. One is that Steve Frank's group has suggested for years that even if you're ovulatory, your progesterone secretion may be insufficient, at least in the early part of the luteal phase. I always thought it would be the late luteal phase, but at the early luteal phase, progesterone is insufficient. Secondly, the endometrium might be messed up. Even though you're ovulatory, there's increased expression of adjuvant acceptors, the HOXA genes, as well as decreased expression of the integrins. So oxypontin is, is the ligand for, for integrin, and as you can see here, I can't point, but on the right, you can see that compared to the top panel, where you have increase in oxypontin, which is the integrin ligand, is decreased in PCOS. So that's the stickiness. The embryo won't stick to the endometrium if you're deficient in the integrins. And this is another theory why ovulatory PCOS patients may not get pregnant. And finally, the third of these is insulin resistance. If you have insulin resistance, and the various models are looking at like that, your implantation rates are affected, even though everything else is fine. You make good eggs, you make good embryos, but you don't implant as well through a mechanism of insulin resistance. And it's because of this that, as I'll show you, frozen cycles work a whole lot better for PCOS patients. So second-line treatment after ovulation induction has failed if you're clomiphene or letrozole resistant has been use of gonadotropins or electrocordery, uh, which is, you know, the um, electrocordery of the ovary, uh, specific um, laparoscopic ovarian surgery. And laparoscopic ovarian surgery performs as well as gonadotropin therapy and less of a chance of multiple pregnancies and hyperstimulation. 
In the United States, we used to do it a little bit more. We rarely, rarely do it now for insurance and other reasons, and we could get into it in this discussion. But, but according to Thessaloniki, it is still a co-equal, a second-line therapy, although, you know, and there are good data that even follow-up, we used to think it, it was only short-acting, three, four years, but there are now data that even for the second pregnancy, patients who have had laparoscopic surgery uh, do pretty well. Gonadotropin therapy in PCOS, as you all know, is tricky uh, because of you have this very narrow window of FSH action, and therefore OHSS is extremely common. We still advocate, and according to randomized trials, it is still advocated to use the low-dose step-up regimen than the step-down regimen. Uh, there's a greater chance of OHSS with the step-down regimen, even though it makes some physiologic sense. So this narrowed FSH threshold, this very small increment in dose that causes the difference between you know, monofollicular development and hyperstimulation is occasioned by elevated insulin, high AMH, and a variety of factors. So one has to be extremely careful. Overall incidence of OHSS is about 10%, which is much higher in IVF. And of course, in IVF, you use higher doses with a higher endpoint result rather than, you know, mono or di uh, follicular development. So what happens pathophysiologically, as you can see on your far right panel, is that you have, with OHSS, you have a de decrease in dopamine receptors and an increased vascularity, an increase in VE at VEGF. And these occasion all the secondary um, phenomena that occasion uh, the clinical syndrome of OHSS. What can you do about it? Well, it's been shown by Cochrane and other multicenter trials that metformin prevents OHSS or decreases the significance of OHSS. And so as an adjunct, metformin does not improve the pregnancy rates, doesn't give you better embryos, although that's been argued, but it decreases the chance of OHSS. The other thing that can help because of the reduction in dopamine receptors is cabergoline. Cabergoline or bromocryptine, but we tend to use cabergoline as a dopamine agonist. So you're increasing the dopamine agonistic effect to lower VEGF concentrations. So that's a combination that's potentially beneficial. And finally, for infertility, the next line, of course, is IVF. Um, and IVF works very well in PCOS. You have more eggs. The fertilization rate is slightly lower, but the pregnancy rates are, are truly quite excellent. And the protocols now have all geared to using uh, agonist triggers to reduce the uh, incidence of OHSS. Um, and of course, if you're doing a fresh cycle, adequate luteal support has to be uh, very careful. But now, more and more, we're not even using fresh cycles. So the outcomes are, are you know, it's always been argued in PCOS, you do IVF and your results are not as good. That's not true. If anything, they're as good or better than tubal disease unless you are obese. So the bugaboo about this is that the confusion about the success of IVF and PCOS is because of obesity and overweight status. These are the SART data. SART is the big database in the United States for IVF outcomes. And it's hard to read the slide, but it says, if anything, it's better in PCOS in young women, particularly those who have tubal disease, unless until you get to an older age. At age 40, it about equals, OK? And so what really explains this is overweight. Overweight and the disruption of the endometrium and increasing the risk of miscarriage reduces your live birth rate. And this emerged as a randomized trial out of China, again with uh, Rick Legro uh, putting together this consortium. It suggests that the way to go with IVF and PCOS is with frozen cycles, right? Stimulate, avoid OHSS, get your embryos, let the cycle go, come back in a frozen cycle, and the pregnancy rates are superior. The follow-up study to this in the normal population showed that frozens were not better than fresh. So it's everything I said about the endometrium and PCOS that explains this. You have a disrupted endometrium, particularly with a hyperstimulation scenario. IVM in vitro maturation, I think, has a place. But for many, many years of study, it is not necessarily ready for prime time yet. 
because even though Cochrane has suggested uh, IVM is better com in PCOS compared to non-PCOS, if you compare it to conventional IVF, it's still not as good. It's been suggested in PCOS if you use IVM, you still, after you generate your embryos, you still put it in in a frozen cycle. And those patients tend to do a little bit better. So the bottom line here with the fertility is that obesity drives a lot of the bad outcomes, including concerns of uh, OHSS because of insulin and so forth. So lifestyle, diet, exercise, insulin sensitizers, and we've studied a number of these, including things like cinnamon that in randomized trials suggest some benefit, uh, chromium may or may not. We don't use the glutazones like pioglutazone, um, Avandia, any of those products because you can't use them in pregnancy and they tend to cause uh, weight gain. Pregnancy outcomes as a group, all PCOS together, you have more stillbirth, you have more perinatal mortality in PCOS. However, it's been pretty much determined, this is a complicated slide and this is just one of many, that it's really only in phenotype A and B. It's very phenotype dependent. So the rate of hypertension in pregnancy, OA, um, gestational diabetes, um, you know, uh, problems of preterm birth and stillbirth are increased primarily in phenotype A and B. The, the, the ovulatory and milder phenotypes don't express this problem. Two minutes on hypothalamic amenorrhea. You know, this people didn't understand for many years, and now we've published a, a couple of papers. These are women who have hypothalamic amenorrhea, hypoestrogenic, and they have polycystic ovaries. And nobody could understand what is it. Is it hypothalamic amenorrhea or is it PCOS? And some of the patients that we studied with hypothalamic amenorrhea, as they became more normal, then expressed full PCOS. It can go in both directions, but it's, in the US, I don't know what it's like in India, but it's, it's very, very common. We're seeing a lot of this, and particularly in New York. Maybe it's the stress of New York, I don't know. But we have a lot of hypothalamic amenorrhea. This is a sampling of 40 patients, and you can see here low gonadotropins, low estrogen, but, but they have high AMH and they have polycystic ovaries. And I, I don't have time, I guess, in the interest of going through the various theories. It can go in both directions. You can have PCOS and develop hypothalamic amenorrhea, but there are some piece, hypothalamic amenorrhea patients out of the normal population that have PCO-like features. And I've seen it reverse, and we have a paper recently uh, on this phenomenon as well. What about aging? Okay, the ovary sort of shrinks down over time. Androgens decline, ovarian size decline, um, and as you get older, paradoxically, you have more normal menses. So the older the polycystic ovary patient gets, the more normal her cycles become. And the reason for this is the follicular cohort. The follicular cohort and the AMH levels decrease in time and allows her to have escape ovulations. And this is a slide that shows that gonadotropin stimulation in those patients who become more regular, you have less of a need to rise and you have uh, less of follicular development as well. Our own studies, we did a 20-year prospective longitudinal study. And as you can see here, AMH across the board decreases. But those patients who ovulated tended to have the lower AMH levels. So if you have a smaller follicular cohort, lower AMH, you tend to ovulate sooner as you get older, okay? So the, um, however, the follicular cohort is large and it continues, which is why we think a lot of the patients with PCOS have a later menopause. And it's been suggested that you may be able, some of the older women with PCOS may still retain their fertility, more so than younger women because they still have more follicles left. This is an area that needs a, a tremendous amount of study still. And as you get to the fourth decade with it in, in our prospective study, you lose the ability to diagnose PCOS. Just like I said earlier with ultrasound, when you get to your 30s, you have to use different numbers to diagnose a polycystic ovary. Well, as you get into late menopause, I mean close to perimenopause, you lose your ability to diagnose PCOS at all. And you can't make a fresh diagnosis of it anymore. But again, in these longitudinal studies, you see testosterone growing, but you start seeing an increase in waist hip diameters, right? And the persistence of insulin resistance, which takes us to the whole concept of cardiovascular disease and PCOS. So 
all these multiple abnormalities, inflammatory markers, insulin resistance, um, lipid dyslipidemias, you know, you would think that they have a lot more cardiac disease and mortality due to it, but it has not been found. And there really has been a suggestion that there's no increase in cardiovascular mortality, except in a few cohorts. Um, and the original study, my bottom line, lowest bullet here, whereas the original Y study from the United States suggested that there was more cardiovascular mortality, that study has been debunked by their own cell, by their authors themselves. They went back and did more coding and found it wasn't true. But I begin here. The original Karolinska series by Eva Dahlgren, where they looked at the cohort of women had had wedge resections in their 20s and followed them out, found that those patients, as they developed menopause, had 40% hypertension, 16% diabetes. You know, bad things. But that doesn't mean heart attacks. And we have suggested that it's very phenotype dependent. You have more cardiovascular endpoint risks if you're phenotype A or B, but not if you're C or D. And I put together this model looking at the spectrum. It's really the classic patients that tend to have the cardiovascular abnormalities in, in metabolism and risk factors. This was the original Shaw studies that suggested looking at survival curves. That, that women with PCOS have more cardiovascular disease mortality, but this was debunked by the authors themselves. They went back and re decoded it and said, ah, sorry, not true. And there are younger cohorts. This is a cohort from Heart from Australia, it's a little bit flawed. They looked at young women. These were young women under 40 that were hospitalized, and they did have more hypertension, they did have more age-related hospitalizations, and mortality in that group was, was small. But it was not a population study. It was hospital-based, so it was somewhat flawed, but it was just a young women. So we looked at that and the wealth of literature and just published this. Myself and Enrico, we came together with this sort of mini-review published. It just came out this month. The answer to this is no. Believe it or not, it's no. Even though they have all these risk factors, unless you're obese, unless you're diabetic, you do not have increased cardiovascular morbidity, which suggests to me, and we, we talk about this in, the, in this review, that they're protective factors. There could be something about PCO that's protecting them against low HDL, high insulin, and so forth. 